Hello and welcome to this lecture, where we'll be looking at aggregations. Aggregations are a way of grouping and extracting statistics from your data. In case you are familiar with relational databases, you can think of this as the equivalent of SQL's group by clause and aggregate functions such as sum. Interestingly, Elasticsearch provides a rather powerful feature that allows you to execute searches and return hits as normal but to also return aggregated results at the same time. These aggregated results are separate from the search hits. And all of this can be returned in a single request, thus avoiding multiple network round trips. There are three types of aggregations, metric, bucket and pipeline aggregations. Pipeline aggregations are experimental and for quite advanced use cases so I won't explain those in this lecture, because the functionality is likely to change. Metric aggregations work on values extracted from the aggregated documents. These values are usually extracted from a specific document field, which is specified in the query. It's also possible to gain more control and return values from a script, but this is beyond the scope of this lecture. Most of the metric aggregations output a single numeric metric, such as the sum aggregation, and are called single-value numeric metric aggregations. Others that generate multiple metrics, such as the stats aggregation, are called multi-value numeric metrics aggregations. This sounds more complicated than it is, so don't worry too much about it, because I'll show you examples of this now. The aggregation that is easiest to understand is the sum aggregation. This single metric aggregation sums up numeric values that are extracted from the aggregated documents. Let's write a simple query that sums up the total quantity of all products in the e-commerce index. So I will just add a match all query because I want to match all of the products in the e-commerce index. Now I will set the size to zero. What this does is that it makes sure that no hits are returned because actually I don't need them right now, at least not in my case. Otherwise they would be returned as normal. So this is the powerful feature that I was telling you about a moment ago. Now to actually add my aggregation, I will add a property with the name X. Now note that you can also name this property for aggregations, but I'm just using the abbreviation for now. It's completely up to you what you want to name it. Within this object, I'm going to add a property with the name of the aggregation that I want to add. So since I'll be using the quantity field and I'll be summing up this field, I'll name it quantity underscore sum. This will be an object as well. And within this object, I will add a property with the type of the aggregation, in this case sum. And again, this will be an object. And within this aggregation object, I will add a property named field, which specifies the field on which the aggregation will work on, in this case quantity. So I'll just go ahead and run this query. As we can see in the results, all of the product quantities sum up to 50,436. Because I used the match all query, all products are used in the aggregation. But let me just try to change the query a little bit and see what the quantity is for all pasta products. So I will change the match all query to be a match query. The aggregated quantity is now 348 because only pasta products are used in the aggregation. Another single metric aggregation is the AVG aggregation, which calculates the average value for a document field. I'll just modify the query slightly. 
So I will update the name of my aggregation to AVG underscore quantity. And I'll change the type to AVG. And that's all I have to do. So let's run the query. And the query now calculates the array quantity for all pasta products. In this case, roughly 31. Another two aggregations are the min and max aggregations, which calculate the lowest and highest value for a document field respectively. I'll just slightly modify the query to use the min aggregation. So I will name my aggregation for min underscore quantity. And I'll change the type to min. As the results show, the lowest value for the quantity field is 2 for all of the pasta products. As you can probably imagine, all I have to do to use the max query is to replace the min aggregation type with max. This time, the results show that the maximum value for the quantity field is 87. These aggregations were so-called single-value aggregations, because they only output a single value. Let's now move on to taking a look at a multi-value aggregation, namely the stats aggregation. This aggregation computes stats from the aggregated documents. In fact, these stats include the aggregations that I have just showed you. So I will change the name of my aggregation to be quantity underscore stats. And I'll change the type to stats. And that's it. This is a multi-value aggregation, simply because it returns multiple values. Looking at the results, we can see that the count of documents is returned, along with the minimum, maximum, and average value for the field. The sum of all of the values for the field is also calculated and returned. There are other metric aggregations, but these were the most important ones. Please have a look at the documentation if you want a full list of available metric aggregations. Now that I have discussed metric aggregations, I will move on to bucket aggregations, which are slightly more complicated. Instead of calculating metrics over fields, Bucket aggregations create buckets, or sets of documents. Each bucket is associated with a criterion, which documents must satisfy to be part of that bucket. Now this is not easy to understand without seeing an example, so let me show you just that. I will use a range aggregation for this example, which lets me group documents together based on ranges for the quantity field, as you will see in just a moment as I type in the query. So I'll change the name of my aggregation to quantity underscore ranges. And I'll just delete the existing aggregation. I'll add a new aggregation of the type range. I'll set the field to quantity. And the ranges property here contains an array of objects, which are going to be the ranges that I want to include. So the first range that I will add will be from 1 to 50, like so. And I will add another one from 50 to 100. Actually, let me just go ahead and change the match query to be a match all query. Note that for each range, the from value is included and the to value is excluded. Within the results, we can see that 483 documents have a quantity in the 1 to 50 range, while 506 documents belong to the 50 to 100 range. A use case for this aggregation could be to find the number of products within certain price ranges, for example, allowing the user to apply a filter for a given price range. 
An interesting feature that's available for bucket aggregations is the ability to add sub-aggregations, which is something that is not possible for metric aggregations. When doing so, an aggregation will aggregate the documents that are in the buckets that the parent bucket aggregation created. Now I hope that doesn't sound too confusing, but if it does, then don't worry about it, because I'm going to give you an example of this right now. So let's say that I wanted stats on the documents within each bucket. To do this, I can add a sub-aggregation of the type stats, which is actually the metric aggregation that I showed you a minute ago. This metric aggregation will then operate upon the documents that are contained within the bucket that the range bucket aggregation creates. Let's see that in action. So I'll go ahead and add a sub-aggregation here. I'll add another object under the property X. I'll call the aggregation quantity underscore stats. And I'll set the type to stats. The field is also going to be the quantity field. So as I said before, Notice that this aggregation right here is going to operate on each of the ranges within the parent aggregation, namely the quantity underscore ranges aggregation. The results now include stats for the documents within each bucket, so the stats aggregation ran within the context of each of the buckets as I mentioned before. So as you can see in the results, for the 1 to 50 range, there's a minimum of 1 and a maximum of 49 for the quantity field. And the average is roughly 25, the sum being more than 12,000. You can even nest aggregations even further than this, although you typically won't need to do this. For example, you could add a sub-aggregation to further subdivide the quantity ranges and then add yet another sub-aggregation of the type stats to get stats for each of these ranges. In fact, there is no hard limit on how deep you can nest aggregations, but of course you will see the performance decrease the more you add. There are quite a few bucket aggregations, but going through them all would take a long time and you probably don't want to hear me ramble on about it for hours. So I'll just mention another useful bucket aggregation. The term aggregation builds a bucket for each unique term for a given field. This could be useful for a gender field, for example, containing either male or female, because it could then be used to count how many persons of each gender there are in an index. This is quite useful, so I'm going to show you how to use this aggregation in a later lecture when building a sample search engine. That's all I wanted you to know about aggregations. Like I said, there are quite a few aggregations that I haven't covered in this lecture, but I have discussed the most important ones that you need to know. The rest are more for edge use cases, so you are much less likely to encounter them. Thanks for watching and happy searching.